from tea and we have our last afternoon of talk so I'll hand over to Edgar who is going to speak about to his cathedral and the origins of the digital universe and I will just uh, show him when he's five minutes left. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon everybody. I'm going to talk about George Dyson's book entitled Church Cathedral and while I, while I do so I'm going to often present his own words and then discuss what the book is about as I go along. On one of the very first pages he introduces himself and he says that in 1956 at the age of three I was walking home with my father, the physicist Freeman Dyson, who by the way is a Nobel Prize winner, from his office at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton when I found a broken fan belt lying in the road. I asked my father what it was it's a piece of the sun, he said. <laughs> so this already shows the beautiful narrative, the way he writes. The emphasis on this slide is Institute for Advanced Study. And Dyson writes about that institute and says, at that institute, more people worked on quantum mechanics than on their own cars. <laughs> so the distinction here is already set. And you, as you read the whole book, it's always about the distinction between, let's say, pure mathematics on the one hand and engineering or applied mathematics on the other and that's important because um, this is about Princeton in the 1940s and 50s and this distinction was felt and also in Cambridge in England as we shall see in a moment. So he writes there was one notable exception Julian Bigelow who arrived at the Institute in 1946 as John von Neumann's chief engineer and the emphasis is on, on engineer. Now the book is not only about von Neumann it's also about Julian Bigelow, and he was a very handy person. John von Neumann, as we saw yesterday, is, was indeed somebody who was neither just a pure mathematician or an applied mathematician. He could do a bit of everything, and that's one of the central themes in the book, which I certainly do not contest. Dyson writes, when the Institute agreed against all objections to allow von Neumann and his group to build a computer, the concern was that the refuge of the mathematicians would be disturbed by the presence of engineers. So again, this distinction. <laughs> At the time of the founding of this institute, mathematics was divided into two kingdoms. Pure mathematics preferably conducted at the institute and applied mathematics preferably conducted outside, somewhere in the industry. With the arrival of von Neumann, the distinctions began to fall. And indeed, the central thesis of the book is that von Neumann projected Turing's 1936 theory onto practice. Uh, building a computing machine, von Neumann was special, and Turing was special. Uh, was special. I'm re representing them with two red circles, two research groups, one in Princeton, one somewhere in England, because I'm, I'm not setting a date here. They were indeed, if you look at it with, uh, with Turing's paper, in the back of your, of your mind, then, then these were two important research groups. And that's the central thesis of the book, which I do not contest. I just want to say as an aside, that as an historian, you could equally well put on some other glasses, or, or I mean, look at it with other criteria, and then conclude that maybe these two blue research groups were special too. Or maybe these two green ones. And I'm going to return to this at the end of my talk. But, George Dyson was raised at Princeton in that intellectual environment in the aftermath of, of von Neumann's uh, success. And so it's, he, he knows many of the people who worked there, he interviewed many people, so it seems fair enough for him to actually write a very good book about the local history at Princeton and the connection between Turing and von Neumann. Now the book is not only about the history of the Institute, and it's not solely about the lives and careers of John and Clary von Neumann. It's about several uh, research projects, all of which were of interest to von Neumann. Developments that led to the atomic and hydrogen bombs, weather predictions, artificial life, etc. And if you want to understand how all of this is interrelated, then this is again uh, very, very useful, this book. It's not only about past technology, it's also about recent technology. Dyson talks about cloud computing and search engines. And I'm uh, citing him here. Facebook defines who we are, Amazon defines what we want, Google defines what we think. 
and in several respect, respects it is actually in, insightful. But I do want to stress, and I'll come back again to this, it's more than just a book about history. This is important. Bigelow, Baricelli, Burks, Smokley, Eckert, Turing, many people are covered in the book, and also Andrew Booth. And just for the short presentation, I'm going to zoom in and talk about Andrew Booth. So Dyson writes that he, that Andrew Booth was alarmed by his mother, alarmed his mother by mending fuses at the age of two. So again, here we have a very handy boy who becomes a handy person, and he contrasts this with the pure mathematician Hardy. Uh, he had a hard time there, so he just left. He left Hardy and uh, Cambridge University, and to pursue physics, engineering, and chemistry on his own. He then got an apprenticeship in Coventry where he worked on X-ray and where he helped determine the molecular structure of PTN, which led to a PhD. So these are all, I'm now paraphrasing Dyson, but these are all the facts from his book. And then Dyson also explains that Andrew Booth later moved near London to build mechanical and electromechanical calculators in order to speed up X-ray analysis work. He was then sent by his boss, to the US, to several research groups which are presented graphically with all those circles. He visited several research groups in the US, several pioneers, including Howard Aiken, von Neumann, Eckert, Morton, and many others. Then in a 2004 interview, he says, Andrew Booth says to George Dyson, that after having visited all those research groups, I went back to New York and I met with Weaver. I was quite clear by then and I said to Weaver, well, the only group that is worth talking to is the lot at Princeton. They were the only people who had really got themselves out of the business of just waving their hands in the air and doing nothing. Now, the book is full of such interviews and I just want to share a bit of my skepticism. I have only one major criticism and I have yet to come to that, but I do at this point want to uh, share my skepticism that this is in 2004, a man talking about his participation in a success story. I'm going to, in a moment, present his very own recollections, which, he, uh, which is in print and which he expressed in 1959, and that's, I will take that as more valuable evidence. But not only does George Dyson have several interviewees talk like this about the past, he also himself repeatedly postulates to have a strong claim. Because he does it so often, you start, to, you start to become overwhelmed and then actually start to believe it. But I'm not saying it's not true what he's saying. So he, this is what he says, for example, Dyson, familiar with both the analytical engine of Babbage and with Turing's universal machine, Booth saw the Institute's project, at that time, Booth saw that Institute's project as the practical implementation of these ideas. This red sentence is a strong claim because the whole point, the whole, the whole thesis is that Turing and von Neumann are, were rather exceptional in seeing that connection. Of course, it is possible that there are indeed some close associates, including Booth, who also saw that. I'm just saying that there's not any very convincing evidence in support of such claims in many cases, and that's my personal opinion. I'm going to give a short intermezzo and present some of my own research on Andrew Booth. In uh, 1959, he gave a keynote speech, and it's in print, in this uh, volume, Annual Review in Automatic Programming, in the series called International Tracks in Computer Science and Technology and Their Application. So at this time, he was a well-established researcher, and we're now talking about the field of automatic programming, which is not anymore computer building. Now, this volume contained papers that had been read at the Working Conference on Automatic Programming of Digital Computers held at Brighton in April 1959, edited by Goodman, with dedication to the memory of the late Alan Matheson Turing. And this is very, very important primary source for people who are interested in Turing's legacy and how did his work, how, how his work influenced uh, the, uh, the, pra the practitioners. In fact, Appendix 1 contains a complete reprint of Turing's paper, along with a follow-up, his 1937 follow-up correction. 
Andrew Booth gave the keynote and, and credited Turing, who first enunciated the fundamental theorem upon which all studies of automatic programming are based. Now, automatic programming at that time, because we don't really use those words today, but the, the, the whole objective of that group of people, group of researchers, was to automate the programming process so that you did not have to write down the machine instructions yourself. That was a very tedious job. So they were trying to automate that and they, they developed what we today call high-level programming managers and compilers. And so Andrew Booth was talking to people, researchers in the field of automatic programming. And he said, and now I'm quoting him, in its original form, Turing's theorem was so buried in a mass of logic that most readers would find it difficult to understand. Simply enunciated, however, it states that any computing machine which has the minimum proper number of instructions can simulate any other machine, however large the instruction repertoire for that. Now, in many universities today, this is uh, obviously taught to students, and it's common knowledge today in many, in many places. Uh, it was not the case in the 50s. Andrew Booth and some others, who are, by the way, mentioned in, in my own work, they were taking ideas from Turing's paper and projecting that onto their practical concerns in the field of automatic programming. And then he continued and he said, all forms of automatic programming are merely embodiments of this rather simple theorem. And although from time to time we may be in some doubt as to how one programming language differs from other programming notations, it will perhaps make things rather easier for what we are doing to bear in mind that they are simple consequences of Turing's theorem. And so here lies the impact of Turing's paper on programming practice in 1959, but also uh, in years before that because there were other people like Booth who were trying to make that connection. Now this is about programming practice, but let's now go back to computer building because that's what Dyson's book is about. So right after, I mean continuing in his keynote, Andrew Booth then asked the following question. Why was it that Turing's original work, finished in 1937 before any computing machine of modern type was available, assumed importance only some years after machines were in common use? And this kind of recollection I find more valuable because it's in 1959. Um, and if you want an answer to this question, I, I would like to refer to my own book. <laughs> I'm not, I, I want to end my intermezzo here and now get back to Dyson's book. So Dyson's book is more than just a book about history. I touched upon that a couple of slides ago. I'm now going to elaborate on that. George Dyson writes, Turing's model of universal computation was one-dimensional, a string of symbols encoded on a tape. Von Neumann's implementation of Turing's model was two-dimensional, so the, the memory, the address matrix, underlying all computers in use today. The landscape is now, today, three-dimensional, so he's talking about the present, yet the entire internet can still be viewed as a common tape shared by a multitude of Turing's universal machines. So George Dyson is using the, what he learned as, as a child and when he grew up in that intellectual environment, he's viewing everything in terms of universal Turing machines and explaining the internet in that manner, which is just fine. Just note that this is not history, but that's just fine. I'm building up my case. Now, why does he use the words Turing's Cathedral for the title of his book? Well, I'm quoting him again, in October 2005, I was invited to Google's headquarters and given a glimpse inside the organization that, had been, that has been executing precisely the strategy that Turing had in mind, and now he's referring to Turing's 1950 article, gathering all available answers, inviting all possible questions and mapping the results. I felt I was entering a 14th century cathedral while it was being built. So, and that's just fine. So he, he sees the, whole, the digital universe actually as starting with Turing's paper and explains, explains present-day technology in terms of Turing's work. And many people at universities do that, so that's just fine. And that's where the title comes from. And it, so the book is not only about von Neumann, because if there were no Turing, there, were, there would be no computers. That's, that's what you feel as you, as you read the book, and I'm coming to that. So now I'm going to claim that the book is not just about the past, the present, and the future, it's even more than that. 
So he writes, Turing's arrival in Princeton in 1936 was followed five days later by the proofs of his now famous 1936 article on computable numbers. These 35 pages would lead the way from logic to machines. And so you can feel that this road from logic to machines is the central theme in the book. And as long as he talks about Princeton, I'm not going to contest that, but it has been contested yesterday, in fact, so that's in, in this sense, this presentation is complementing yesterday's presentation. I'm going to assume that that is, I'm not going to touch that. But you can feel that he's viewing everything as a road from logic to machines, as Turing as being this central figure. And he even says it himself, so it makes, makes it easy for me now. He says, how did the von Neumann vector manage to outdistance all the other groups trying to build a practical implementation of Turing's universal machine in 1946. And so, people who are studying the history of computing cannot accept this because he's now, and I'm going to show it graphically, he's projecting those red colors onto all other research groups worldwide, claiming that they were building a universal Turing machine, or if you don't buy this, I'm going to weaken my argument, he's going to judge all these other research groups and I'm going to say, he's going to judge them and, and ask how well they were doing in building a, a universal Turing machine. But they, they didn't even know who Turing was, many of them. So that's just a step too far. And it's not that it's in one part in, of the book, you feel it as you go along. And what he's actually doing is he's complying with an hourglass model. And I'm making it explicit here by showing this model. You have all these parallel developments converge, and then you have, thanks to Turing's paper and the insights, of, thanks to Turing's theory and the insights of von Neumann, all these research groups could now start to build a computer, which is historically completely inaccurate. Now, as a second intermezzo on this one on this slide, the hourglass model can be very useful. So Martin Davis has used it very usefully with two co-authors in this book, which is not on history where he explains the fundamentals of theoretical computer science. And I learned a lot about mathematical logic and computer science because he explains everything. He explains why Turing's theory is so, so, so powerful. Because you can explain many things in terms of a recast version of Turing's 1936 paper. It's for educational purposes. This hourglass model is very effective to explain the relationship between theory and practice. Unfortunately, theoreticians, it's not only George Dyson, but especially theoreticians, and this might this is actually less surprising, they describe at some point in their career they start to write about history and, ex and comply with this hourglass models. For example, Robinson, who had a great career, at some point writes papers about history with very few references and it actually ex says that everything happened in compliance with this hourglass model. So the titles of his papers, for example, are Logic, Computers, Turing and von Neumann, The Role of Logic in Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence. And this is basically very similar to Dyson's book. And unfortunately, Martin Davis has done the same. He has written a history book where he is now, he's not distinguishing between the model and reality. In reality, it didn't happen like this, but the model is very effective. And that's why, by the way, Turing is deservedly considered the father of computer science, because he has offered us at the end of, of, I mean, after several years, he has offered us a very effective theory. Now, some historians distinguish between the hourglass model and would much rather try to capture the past by describing something in compliance with a seed model where you have independent developments. So, on, on one line of development, you have Howard Aiken, on another, you have Conrad Zuse, on yet another, you have Turing and von Neumann, etc. And if you have even more time as a historian, if you've got many, many years to conduct this research, you will we'll want to try to capture the history in a more realistic manner. And then you'll accept, of course, that several developments converge, some diverge, etc. And there's one person who has done this this year after many, many years of research, and that's Paul Sirus in his book, Computing a Concise History, where he puts Turing in context. Yes, Turing was very important, but so were other pioneers. And he's not only talking or explaining the red circles, he's explaining what all these other groups were doing and why they were special as well. And that's, I really recommend this book. Well, let me just conclude 
Dyson's book is not just a book about history, which is just fine. It's all about understanding the present and the future from Princeton's perspective. So from with Turing's paper, or Turing's work as a roadmap, which is just fine. Unfortunately, he projects Princeton's local history onto all other computing groups, and that's, that's not fine. So, make, let's make it explicit. It's an hourglass model, which from, for historians is a very naive model. Let's step away from it. If you've got time, go to a CV model. If you've got a whole career ahead of you, go for a realistic model. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the presentation. I, I'm very sympathetic, of course, to the, to the approach. And uh, even though it's not directly connected, I was thinking while you talk, but not before that, about the fact that you know, this kind of, um, a, a, of movement from a what you call the, the hourglass model to, to the sieve, etc., has been pursued in, uh, in fields uh, in the history of science where people have been working for longer periods of time. For example, uh, just to give you an example, I think that it's very relevant, it's about Galileo in the center of the scientific revolution, uh, who was presented very much in that way, as I said, but I would say more and then this applies also uh, to, to what you say it's the, the what was called the model of history of ideas as if ideas have a life of their own which is independent of anything that happens around it's a uh, completely ethereal in the world of ideas and precisely well there has been a, a very strong development of that kind of history for example, in the case of Galileo, his involvement with the engineers at the time. I don't know if you are aware of this. And I think that was a point that you want to stress here, even though you didn't say much yes, about it. Right. Uh, and, and I also mentioned it a little bit yesterday. Then you see that part of these ideas require the... Uh, even, even in the case of Galileo, we're not talking about something that led to a machine. Here, we're talking about that then even more. That without this interaction, with the real world of the, the people. In the case of Turing, he was the one who, who had the, the interaction himself. He didn't need the other people. But uh, to believe that, you know, because you have an idea, a very strong idea, that as you said, especially in retrospect, you can really understand how strong it was. It doesn't mean that it was that strong at the beginning. And we, I think that in this case, you can see very strongly, and, and you, you suggest that very very nicely, I think, that uh, this interaction is absolutely necessary, because otherwise uh, the ideas wouldn't, and I, and I was reading a little bit of the book, and he repeats this, so he go. it's not just as you presented, actually it's from Leibniz, you know, this is Leibniz to the machine, the machine is the embodiment of Leibniz ideas, it's too, yeah, too that, far that, 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 that he does just once or twice in the yeah. book from Leibniz, because that he got from, he refers to his yeah. sources, which is Martin Davis's book, where that's throughout the whole book, this line where he is. But yeah, okay. Are there any other questions you have? Uh, uh, one comment and a question. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it was your book. I, I, I saw a, uh, a comment once about anybody can build a house, but if you don't have a foundation, that house isn't going to last. And so to me, it, it doesn't seem like whether they were actually implementing Turing's model or not is, is in a way irrelevant. What Turing gave them was the foundation so those computers they built lasted. And so I'll speak from the theoretician standpoint that I think Turing's contribution is huge. Uh, but the question I wanted to ask you was, in Turing's paper in 36, he built, you know, he solved the uh, decision problem and then in 38, he introduced the Oracle, and Dyson mentions that he introduced the Oracle because he realized the computer that he designed in 36 couldn't do what the mathematician could. And that's why he introduced the Oracle. And then in 1950, he wrote, Can Machines Think? Which seems like he flipped back to, well, his machine in 36 could do more than he thought in 38. Uh, you want to comment on that at all? Preferably not, because that's something for 
something not securing his life very well. So that's an homogeneous or I don't want to comment on that. Okay. Maybe in five years. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So, so the problem is, like the speaker yesterday said, there's so many sources that I'm only now starting to dig into Maurice Wilkes' work, which is very important, and I'm not just not able to comment on that. But we can, I mean, historians can see that there, there's some books around that are not very. Uh, there's a there's a flaw in the methodology. But digging into all these sources, primary sources, is going to take years of time. So, I guess because all the all the attention is going to Van Norman and Turing, but that's why I don't think. I do know that among the historians on the user group, there are many people who are who want to hear Mocking Eckert's voice heard because they are not very happy with all of this Turing <laughs> uh, attention. But yeah, I don't. I, I don't think it's Turing. I, I it's about knowing the potential of the future. Finding out more about these other people, I think, because the fact that it's the reverse. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. It helps you too. A lot of the history now is emerging because of the yeah. interest mm -hmm. in the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that could be. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Mm -hmm. No? Okay, thank you very much. YouTube, I've got a 15 minute presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it now, but I, mean, I only got uh, that wouldn't be fair to the other speaker. Okay, thank you.